Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery, your host for today's session. I would like to share with everybody that next Tuesday, February 27th at 9 a.m. at Honolulu Holly will be the day the city council determines whether the older buildings will be required to retrofit their fire sprinkler systems. Don't know what the Vegas odds are on that, but I can tell you that hundreds have testified against it because of the cost burden it may put on homeowners. That being said, we're all concerned about fire safety, and we encourage every building to look at fire safety issues and take necessary steps uh, to protect their residents. Today, we're gonna talk about an issue that has surfaced that there's a lot of misunderstandings on, and that is that when an association forecloses on an apartment owned by an owner and gets possession and want to rent it out, what's the best way to do it? What are the risks and rewards? And I've asked a very good friend of mine and very knowledgeable guy on this topic, Peter Wargo, to join me today and talk about to do or not to do with regard to association rentals of condos, of units owned by condo boards. Anyway, Peter Wargo, welcome to the show, and I've known you for decades. Tell us a little bit about you so everybody knows who you are. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on the show, Richard. And uh, yeah, I've known Richard for a long time. Um, I came over to Hawaii uh, uh, over 40 years ago uh, in the military, and uh, like a lot of people at that time, retired and decided to stay in this beautiful land and got uh, into real estate, started my own company, and I've been a real estate broker and involved in property management and rentals for 35 years. If I remember correctly, you were actually in the Special Forces and went to Vietnam, among other places. Uh, that is correct. Well, let me thank you for your service, as they do all the military, because certainly if we didn't have people willing to stand up for our country and our values, uh, we would be maybe not in the place we are today. So thank you for your service. Thank you, and, and thank you for acknowledging that. Anyway, let's talk about something that's dear to my heart, is when you look at the Condo Association, yeah. and you look at, I'll make it up, a 100-unit project, and they do a budget every year. They depend on all 100 people paying their maintenance fees. It's not like a profit-making enterprise. They basically look at the cost of operation, and they look at dividing it by either percentage of common interest or whatever the documents say by 100 people. And so if one person or more doesn't pay, it leaves a puka in the budget. You don't have the money. And so we see where associations regularly will foreclose on an owner, and sometimes banks if they're not paying their mortgage. Could you just briefly share with us, we hear the terms judicial foreclosure, non-judicial foreclosure, in real layman's terms, what the difference is? Yeah, I can do it in layman's terms because I'm not an attorney, and I know you've covered the subject many times. Uh, but if you think of it in layman's terms, as I would, that uh, judicial is a long process, and that's usually where you're trying to procure the title it takes a long time, it's very expensive, it takes a lot of legal help. The non-judicial route was really kind of a fast track, uh, less money, you don't get the title, but you can get possession of the unit uh, and the right to at least uh, try to rent the unit. So that was my understanding of the difference between the two. So yeah, time and money. I think that's pretty accurate. My experience has been because of all the changes in the foreclosure law, it could take a lender three or four years to foreclose and clean up the title, for lack of a better, a better word, so you have clear title. That's correct. Where a non-judicial foreclosure can be done in a matter of months and give you possession. So you somewhat foreclose around the mortgage, for example, or second yeah. mortgage, whatever it may be, giving you possession. And the benefit to, to well, first of all, which way do the associations usually go and why? Well, most of them are going to go with uh, non-judicial because you want to get someone in there to generate income, as you said. Uh, you're never going to have 100% of the people paying, but if uh, you know you're going to lose some, but if you can get some people in there renting um, and get some of those maintenance fees paid, which help to balance that budget, then that's the smart way to go. And it's fairly easy. Question then becomes, as we're interested in, is who should be handling that rental, finding the person, getting it in there, and accounting for the funds? Now, we'll get into that in a minute, but... Staying on point with regard to the foreclosure issue, uh, 
I've always looked at it as that an association, when someone's not paying, they're leaking oil, for lack of a better word. They don't have all the money to pay their bills or fund their reserves, depending on what it may be. That's correct. So by getting someone in and getting possession, not clear title, because you foreclosed around the existing liens, for lack of a better word, um, they start getting cash flow for the rent. So the question I ask you is, do you know, maybe uh, you don't, when an owner, let's just say you rented it for $1,000 a month, does that go towards the delinquency or is that just other income? No, I, it's, it's other income. You cannot collect, uh, as I understand it, the delinquency, late fees or anything like that, but up to a certain amount, and I'm not sure off the top of my head whether it was up to six months or more, I think the law had changed sometimes, but uh, to pay for the basic um, uh, maintenance fee amount, you can collect that amount and apply it. Yeah, well, it's, and just to help you with that is, is that at the time you have non-judicially foreclosed and the association takes possession, again, not title, they are now the owner of the association. And so when they rent it out, it's just rental income to the association. It's not applied to the delinquent owner's account. That account still remains in collection with the attorneys and still fully owed. So the amount that that owner is paying in rent would, number one, cover the maintenance fees since you took possession. So you're not getting any worse off. Correct. And then number two, you might be making a slight profit because of the fact that you know the rent of $1,000 might be more than the maintenance fees of maybe $400. So that's just extra additional income. That in some ways, a cash flow strategy helps recover the lost cash flow of the former owner, but really not legally. So the rent's not legally applied to to the unit. Is that your that, understanding? That too? was my understanding, and that the additional money above and beyond uh, what that uh, maintenance fee or what is owed, I, you have to account for that somewhere down the line. Uh, yeah. Was my understanding. Yeah. Well, I think you know. The, 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 of course, the law has changed so many times. One of the things that's interesting about that is that typically when they're not paying their maintenance fees, they're not paying their lender and the mortgage either. That's correct. And so what happens is, because we described the judicial foreclosure, which a lender would use, could take three or four years. At some point in time, the lender will get a commissioner appointed. Now, what happens to the rent once the commissioner is appointed? It's my understanding that once that takes place, then in fact, uh, the uh, ability and the uh, the ownership, if you will, for being able to rent it stops with the association. The commissioner takes it over and the court has uh, awarded it at that point. So the monies have to be accounted for to the commissioner. That's right. So in essence, the tenant would then start paying the commissioner the rent. However, the commissioner would still be obligated to pay the maintenance fees while he's in possession. So you're still getting your cash flow. The, the commissioner couldn't take the rent and not pay the maintenance fees. He would have to pay from the time he took over and the order was made with the commissioner, he would have to pay the rent to, that move, is it, correct. to move it forward yeah. with respect to that. So anyway, let's kind of move it along a little bit. Is So now you've had a situation, the association's not getting paid. They want to do a non-judicial foreclosure so they can get the cash flow, hopefully, by renting it out. Um, and they get possession because they get a non-judicial foreclosure. The first thing that comes up, they may have to put some money into the apartment to rent it. It's because it might be in bad condition. Correct. Uh, but then, meanwhile, as that kind of levels out, they'll evaluate the money they need to put into it versus the rental income. Typically because it takes so long for a lender to foreclose, there's usually plenty of time to recover any small investment you make in the property. So now you have this unit and you want to rent it out. And the, and the big thing I get over, asked over and over and over again is, is it better for the association to rent it or is it better for them to hire a realtor? And putting that in perspective, I'd like to approach this from, oh, I hate to say the pros and cons of each way. So. Let me ask you this question right off the bat. So if the association has possession, do they have the legal right to rent it out without hiring a licensed realtor? Yes. And why do they have that right, Jim? Well, because they basically are the owner 
they own the unit, and so it doesn't fall under the, the law of uh, having to have a license if they're managing it themselves. Question I would always ask is, why would you want to take on that responsibility, and what are those responsibilities? Yeah, there's a lot of li liability with respect to that. But in simple terms, the association could say we're going to rent it and either appoint a board member and or a resident manager to find the tenant. You know, if you have an empty unit, let's, let's kind of walk through the steps, what you got to do. Yeah. If you have an empty unit, what do you got to do? Well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to market for it. You've got to make sure that it's ready to be occupied. Uh, you go through the marketing, that's a cost. You've got to screen when you start getting uh, candidates, potential tenants. Uh, you want to make sure that you're doing uh, uh, credit reports. Uh, how are you going to do that? Who's going to pay for that? Uh, who's making the decision that this person is, uh, uh, you know, is qualified as far as income wise? And how do you make sure that you're not violating any rules or laws as far as uh, discrimination for some reason that you say, Geez, we don't want a family that large or that small. Uh, most of the people that are on the board or the resident manager doesn't have that background or training or schooling. Um, so all those things have to be considered. And then once you get them checked in, someone's got to do the check-in, someone's got to have some forms. Who's writing up the rental agreement? You need to have some kind of an agreement in writing. Who's going to do that? Where are you going to get it? Um, who's going to make sure that it's legal? And then once you've done that and you've put them in, who's going to maintain making sure the rent's paid? How are you going to account for that rent? If there's a security deposit involved, how are you accounting for that security deposit? All of these things, both the physical, the administrative, and the fiscal responsibility uh, of handling that unit and that tenant uh, are involved. So basically under the landlord tenant code, even though it's an association owned unit run by the yeah. board or the resident manager, they're going to have to comply with all the landlord tenant code. And there are risks if you don't pay the security back, deposit back on time or, or have very detailed records of the damages the tenant may have cost. By not following the statute, my recollection is it's a deceptive trade practice and it's treble damages. In theory, you could have to pay three times back the security deposit if you haven't given all the right notices or and if you're withholding some of the fund because of alleged damage, you have all sorts of legal requirements to do that you're now imposing on yourself or on the association. That is correct. And that's that's why you should lean towards, I think, not that I'm a real estate broker and that we handle rentals, but that's what uh, we're schooled for, trained for, have the experience for to take care of those things, to take uh, on those liabilities on behalf of the board and to handle that for them so they don't have to get involved with that. But it could be very expensive if you make a mistake. And I think you should look at, I always try to look at the end product when I'm asked that question by a, by a board. Uh, assume you do it on your own. Are you really going to save any money? And let's say, worst case, uh, something like you forget or you don't get the security deposit returned on time or you do it wrong and you don't have a written agreement and they take you to court or they take you to small claims court. Who's handling that? Does your insurance cover that? Is your insurance carrier going to help you? Well, there's Who's a lot of liabilities liable? on yeah. this, and I want to spend some more time on that. But we're going to take a short break for a minute and come back with Peter Wargo talking about renting an AOEO-owned unit. What's the better way to go? Be right back in a minute. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by, and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by, and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of So we do it.
But I'll come back to Condo Insider. We're sitting with broker Peter Wargo talking about when an association through a non-judicial foreclosure gets possession of a unit and the risks of renting it out themselves versus uh, the rewards of maybe saving a few bucks and a real estate commission fee. And we, when we kind of broke off, we were talking about the various steps you need to do to rent a unit. Obviously find a tenant, maybe do a credit check, uh, sign a lease, a legal document. I think a lease is gonna be mandatory. And then you have to make sure that they pay their rent on time and what happens if they don't, if you have to send notices, uh, if they check out, getting their security deposit back, for example, and there's all sorts of timing and inspections that we think there's a claim because they damage the unit. Um, it, it seems like an awful lot of work. It is. And um, matter of fact, I think we're probably underpaid. But, <laughs> but when you look at trying to do all of that on your own, and you're not an expert in that field, plus you have all your other duties. Let's face it, board members are volunteers. Um, and even if they gave them an increase in pay to do something like that, um, five times zero is still zero. They are volunteers. Uh, highly recommend against doing a, a resident manager, even if you get the association to agree to it. That's not what their job is for. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and that's kind of putting a burden uh, where it should not be. I know in a few minutes we're going to get involved with what I call the horror story, some examples of ones that went south or didn't work out too well because of the problem. But from my experience, the thing that I see as problematic, even if you had the best tenant and the best credit or whatever, is your managing agent really is handling the maintenance fees and the normal common expenses. It takes an extra step on their part to make sure you establish a rental unit in their system you know that you're charging a thousand in rent, so you see on the delinquency of us not being paid. It becomes a whole accounting issue that when you signed your contract with the managing agent, it really wasn't an engineer with the thought of throwing on a rental unit or more uh, to do that. And what happens, I've seen so many times, because it wasn't handled and coordinated well with the managing agent, they lost track on the status of the property in the sense that they weren't getting paid on time or the rents weren't being paid um, properly. And, uh, and so uh, certainly having good accounting uh, and holding someone with a license responsible it seems to me to be a, a good business judgment safety check on, on that situation. Comments? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, for one, do not think it's prudent uh, or wise to I have the management management company that's handling the association to have the rental monies uh, going through that that accounting system. Number one, it's hard to keep track of even if you have separate lines for it. Um, when you use a separate rental company, there are requirements under under the law under 521. For example, security deposits need to be put in a separate client trust account, counted for that way. Um, a separate accounting for the operating account. You're providing that extra step and layer of accounting um, and fiduciary liability. <clears throat> and you're actually assuming the fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the, of the board. Well, let's talk about a couple of horror stories. And I think it was ironic that you <clears throat> and I, before we came over yeah. today, was talking to one of our community managers. And if I understood her correctly, in this particular case, the association decided to rent the unit themselves. And usually when you have a rental agreement, if there is one, the agreement requires after five days, like a late fee and a penalty and notice. And as we were talking to this manager, just by accident before we were coming over and preparing for the show, she says, what do I do? We have a tenant, we can't find the lease because the association did it themselves. And we've discovered that they haven't paid his rent for the tune of about fifteen thousand, if I heard it correctly. So that's, that's what I heard too. That's a about long period of ten time. to fifteen months, or yeah. whatever it may be, of not paying it, <clears throat> and no one did anything about it. And meanwhile, they decided to do something about it, and the tenant died. That is correct. So <laughs> it's a good? perfect storm. I, 
<laughs> so I'm asking you to speculate because we are not yeah. lawyers and we don't know. That's true. So what do you think is going to happen on that? I think bottom line is uh, they're not going to collect a cent. That would be my feeling. Number one, there's no written contract. Uh, it's going to have to go to some kind of uh, litigation, even if it's against an estate. question would be, is there an estate? What's left? Uh, you have no written contract. You have no set standard policies and procedures. For example, no one was sending notices. Hey, you haven't paid. They haven't been accounting for the funds. Uh, question comes to my mind, uh, who's been accounting for the funds? Uh, who's liable? Um, but I think the association and the board is just going to eat that one. That's simple. Yeah, the way I, I don't know the, all the facts. We only had a few minutes with her. Yeah. But to me, it goes back to my earlier comment about associations, managing agents. Unless they're really brought into the loop and you set up accounting of that, they're not going to know. If you had a licensed realtor, they're responsible to make sure the rents are paid on time, send the re delinquency letter or the late fee letter saying you haven't paid your rent, and identify to the board, hey, we haven't got the rent this month or next month, and be taking action, uh, you have to certainly file an eviction, yeah. based on the non-payment, not waiting 10 to 15 months, in this, I'm guessing in this case. Yeah, what I deals think. Because I don't know how they're gonna get their money, because I'm assuming if the guy is renting, he doesn't have much assets, and now that he has a state that's gonna go to probate, you're going to spend another 15000 trying to make a claim for 15000 yeah. It's not an easy situation. I agree. And, and, you know, and I think the board and associations need to take into consideration that when you use someone who's licensed, there are other layers of protection. For example, when you have a, a, a real estate license, you have to answer to the DCCA. You have certain requirements that you must follow under the law. Most... Uh, Rental companies are going to be members of the Board of Realtors. There's additional ethics requirements. So an association has several layers of, of protection to try to recoup additional funds than when they're just doing it on their own uh, and they have no accounting for it. And, you know, that's, that's going to be the worst case on those, you know, and it ends up going to some kind of litigation. To me, the judge, uh, the ones I've been involved with, is, you know, where's your proof? Where's the written documentation? How have you been accounting? What's your procedure? What are your standard operating procedures for handling this? And if your answer is, we don't have any, Your Honor, um, I think you're not going to go anywhere. Oh, I agree. Let's talk about one more hard case that, uh, okay. again, we will protect <clears throat> the names of the innocent or guilty, depending on how you want to look at it. If you try to do it yourself, you really never know what the deal is and who you're renting to. I've seen cases where there are, I hate to call them insider deals, where the resident manager's friend or the board's friend, they rented it to them at maybe a less than market rate or they rented it to them and there is no lease whatsoever and they just think they're doing the association a favor because they don't have to pay a uh, commission. By the way, what is the typical commission for something like this? Uh, normally, our management fee is 10%. Uh, again, it's negotiable, but that's uh, uh, usually kind of the standard that we look for based upon the effort and the amount of work that we have to do. But an example I just gave you, horror store number two, in, in, in my understanding in this particular case, they didn't know who they were being rented. And because there was no lease or the lease was done between the unknown unfound lease was done between the board president and an individual that they end up losing because it was an expensive place like 25 or thirty thousand dollars of unpaid rents because in that case allegedly the president and the and the and the individual made an agreement lease agreement allegedly signed or no one had a copy of it no one coordinated with the management company, so it never appeared on the balance sheet on the delinquency page or anything. It's all of a sudden, well, we assume he's paying, and he wasn't paying, and all of a sudden, they then had to evict him, although I think he voluntarily left. Um, uh, it just seems that, does that meet the business judgment rule of a board, you know? When you, that's, that's a good question. Is the board meeting their, uh, you know, fiduciary responsibility? I. Again, we're not lawyers, but uh, if I was an owner, I would I would question that board uh, 
pretty seriously. And I agree, a number of horror stories just like that where we've been asked to take over a, a unit and it turns out that the, uh, you know, the, the board president or vice president's uh, cousin was the one who was gonna handle the rental. And by this time, you know, behind, no money, where is the money? Um, you know, and I think it puts the board in a precarious position. Well, let me say this, we're at the end of our show. And first of all, I want to thank you for being here and well, sharing us with this. Uh, the, the title of the show is to do or not to do on condo rentals. Well, let me tell you that, yes, you want a non-judicial foreclose. Yes, you want to get possession. Yes, you want to rent them out. And this show may be steered in your mind to the thought you should hire a professional realtor to rent it out, not do it yourself. And yes, that's correct. That's the right answer. You really should hire a professional in your business judgment to protect yourself from potential claims of violation of the Fair Housing and the Landlord Tenant Code. Um, there's all sorts of high risk and cost to that. You're assured of knowing that the tenant's been properly vetted, and you're assured of knowing you've set up processes and procedures to make sure you get paid. You know, and so it sounds like we were kind of leading this to, that's what you should do, it's because we are. Because as professionals in the real estate business, I think you would agree, it makes more sense to protect the association by using licensed professionals when trying to rent out. I've seen more bad come from trying to save a few bucks by doing some kind of side rental deal on an association-owned unit. And Agreed? in the end, and in the end, they usually end up losing more money than what they would have gained. Well, again, thank you for being here, and thank, thank all you. of you for tuning in to Condo Insider. This show is all about association living and the challenges we face. Uh, next week we have a discussion about the Douglas Trade Show, the largest property management trade show in Hawaii. We have its, its head, I don't know what the official title is, of Ken Cantor, but he's coming in to talk about all the seminars, all the education, all the things you can learn from attending the Douglas Trade Show and how to get a free pass. So anyway, thanks, hui ho. We'll see you next Thursday, 3 o'clock. Aloha. Aloha.